have this evening of, of looking at your word and studying it together. Uh, for those, Lord, that we've mentioned this evening, um, you know, obviously, the circumstances and the situation in each case, uh, and we pray that, above all, that whatever the situation might be, uh, that these folks would have the peace that passes all understanding, and that they would uh, would would take their, their, their burdens uh, to you in prayer, and that uh, we, as, as members of the body of Christ and fellow believers, uh, would minister to them comfort them and uh, and remind them of all that we have in Christ uh, and and it's in his name that we pray amen all right I got to get a good stiff drink here to hmm thank you oh it was patty oh well see you don't don't take credit for something she did so thank you patty um, all right Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. We've been for a couple weeks now. We're just doing a little like mini study, I guess, uh, through the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. It is uh, probably my favorite chapter in all the Bible, and it it really, to me, is is just packed with a lot of really good information, uh, a lot of really good assurance, a lot of really good confidence building information. Uh, it's the passage where. You know, we preach often uh, when we when we talk about physical trials and difficulties and problems, uh, and we have the little little uh, saying that we we use: uh, "When you hurt, remember your eights." And that's Romans eight, verse eighteen, verse twenty-eight, and verse thirty-eight. And uh, we're just getting down in Romans now to the first of those eights, verse eighteen, uh, and we'll talk about that some tonight. But it is, uh, as I said, for me, it's just a, a chapter that gives great assurance for believers and a chapter that uh, when you're, whatever your circumstance might be, even if you're wishing to be strangled to death or whatever that Keith was talking about there, um, it's still a, a chapter that can, can give us great great comfort, great assurance, great calming, uh, because it, it takes our, the position that we have in Christ as being dead to the flesh and then it builds a lot of truth and a lot of information around that and what that means to us and what that means for this life now. You know, we've looked at some of that the last couple of weeks. Um, if you look uh, back up to verse uh, verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So he's talking there about our, our present life, how we walk, how we conduct ourselves, how we comport ourselves, that we are, are dead to the flesh. Uh, we're, not, we're not debtors to the flesh. We don't live after the flesh. We're alive in the Spirit. We live after the Spirit. Uh, he gives us the assurance in verse 17. We are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And we talked about that a little bit last week. Um, I wasn't really going to elaborate on it too much tonight. There's, there's, there's two sufferings there. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time Time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I think it was Keith asked a question about, you know, are those two sufferings the same there? Verse 17, we suffer with him, but then verse 20, the sufferings of this present time. Uh, and to me, they're two, they're two different things. The whole the whole theme here of sort of Romans 6, 7, and, and 8 is us being dead to Christ, dead to sin, dead to, to the law, and dead to the flesh. And so that involves us being identified with the sufferings of Christ, being identified with his death. If you go back to, to Romans chapter 6 uh, and verse number... Um, verse number two, of course, he, he, he starts in verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And it's interesting, you know, we, we talk about this issue of eternal security and talk about um, are, we, are we secure in Christ? Can we lose that salvation? Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. I've always thought that we understand that in Romans 1 through 5, Paul Paul deals with the issues of salvation, deals with the issues of justification by grace through faith. Uh, in chapter 1, 2, uh, and part of chapter 3, he, he's condemning mankind. Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, all the world is guilty before God. All those issues are settled. The second half of chapter 3, and then chapter 4 and 5, he gets into the justification by grace through faith. Chapter 5, uh, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Takes that all the way through chapter 5. 
and it seems like when he gets to the end of chapter 5 that, that he's assuming that what you now believe and understand is that I am secure in Christ and I cannot lose that salvation. Because the first question that comes up always, you know, when you're dealing with someone about that issue, and you're dealing with the issue of being secure in Christ, and your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, the, what, what's the first question they ask? You, you, mean, you, mean, you mean I could go, and they always use, I could go kill somebody, and I, I'd be okay? That's always the first question. And it's almost like, so Paul Paul realizes when, when he presents this doctrine, and you get to the end of chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, you should understand your security in Christ. And then he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Like he's anticipating the question, you mean to tell me that I can just go out and sin, and I can go out and kill somebody, and I can go out and, you know, whatever. You, or, you mean to tell me that if Adolf Hitler got saved on his deathbed, he's, he's saved? And... Yeah. In fact, if Adolf Hitler got saved when he was 10 years old and then did all that terrible stuff, he's still saved. He's, he's in Christ. And, and Paul, it's, it's like Paul, in the first five chapters, when you get to the end of that, he, he understands, and I guess I, I look at it from the perspective of that means that, that because he starts chapter 6 with that question, that he has... By the time you get to the end of chapter 5, the issue of your justification by grace through faith and that standing in Christ is settled. It's a settled issue. And, and you know, he's, he's ready to, you know, okay, I'll, now I'm going to anticipate the questions that come from that. But it's a settled issue. We talk sometimes, you know, we can go to great lengths to prove, you know, we're eternally secure and, we're, and all of that. And there, there are a lot of passages that deal with it. But from Paul's perspective, when he gets done with those first five chapters of the book of Romans, you should understand, I am secure in Christ. And then that leads to the question, now what? You know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer to that, which is what we want to talk, you know, applies to tonight. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? No, you know that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. So when we read in chapter 8, verse 17, If children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Um, I believe that's the reference Paul's making there. We are baptized into his death. We are buried with him by baptism into death. So all that that Christ experienced on the cross becomes part of our identity. So his sufferings, we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And of course, that, that pattern, and we're going to see that on down in the book of Romans, that pattern goes through if we're, we're uh, crucified with him, buried with him, risen with him, ascended with him, glorified with him, all of that identity that is his becomes ours. So the first suffering in verse 17 if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, is, is, is the, the identification with Christ. It's the position we have. It's being identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. Then in verse 18, he draws a conclusion you know, for or because, uh, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Those sufferings are not sufferings with him, I, uh, sufferings you get by being identified with him. It seems to me those sufferings are the sufferings of this present time. The things that we're suffering right now. The day-to-day -day things of this life. So, yes, you suffered with him in our identification with him, but there are also sufferings right now, and those sufferings, some of them may be similar to the sufferings of Christ in that it's, a, it's an infirmity in the flesh, it's something you're experiencing in the flesh, but we don't suffer in this life, most of us anyhow, uh, anything close to the sufferings of Christ, and we certainly don't suffer the sufferings of Christ that had to do with his spiritual suffering on the cross, that had to do with the death of the cross that is his separation from the Father and his alienation from the Father. We, don't, we can never understand and experience what that was like. So we become identified with it through our baptism into his death, but we don't experience that in our lives. But verse 18 
The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So um, that, that kind of you know, makes a little transition into verse 18 there. Uh, and we want to start talking about that tonight, the sufferings of this present time, which are not worthy to be compared with the glory revealed in us. We've talked many times about the fact that uh, when, when, when we use the word compared uh, and the, the, the difference between comparing and contrasting something, when you compare things, you're talking about the things that are similar about them. When you contrast things, you're talking about the things that are different about them. So if you're going to compare two things, you know, we, we kind of use them interchangeably, but comparing is, is the similarities and contrasting is the differences. So Paul is saying that uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So there is no, the sufferings and the glory, there's no comparison between them. That means there's nothing similar about them. So if there's nothing similar about them, then what is true about them? They're completely different. It's all contrast. Since there's no similarity, there, it's, all, it's all contrast. It's all difference. Um, keep your hand here and go over to 2 Corinthians. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm getting, I, I've, I've got to get a new, I've got several places in Paul's epistles where the corner of the page is torn off and I don't have the verses, so I have to print out the verses and stick them in there, so if I need to read that verse, I, I have it, so, um, but you know, of course, I'll get the same, same Bible probably again, but you, you just know where stuff is on the page, and it, it, you know, it's just, like getting rid of a Bible is like getting rid of a comfortable pair of shoes, it just, oh, I don't, I hate those new shoes, and I, I shouldn't say I hate new Bibles, new Bibles are fine, but it's just, when they're, they're stiff and they're hard to flip pages in and all that. So, But one of these days I'll have to break down. When I have more little pieces of paper sticking in than I have pages, then I'll have to get one. Um, so 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. And of course, this is the passage, I believe, that's a good companion with Romans chapter 8, verse 18, because it, it actually puts some, uh, some definition around what are the contrasts. Because it talks here about our light affliction in verse 17, and it says that light affliction is but for a moment. So we know two things about the affliction, about the sufferings of this present time. One is that they are light, and the other is that they are but for a moment. Then in verse, uh, the end of verse 17, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. What we know about the glory, and Paul's talking back in Romans 8, 18, shall not, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So the sufferings, or the afflictions, and the glory the contrast there in Romans 8 is the contrast he's explaining in 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, it, so the, the light affliction works a heavy weight of glory. So light affliction, weight of glory. So that's the contrast. They're, 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 they're not worthy to be compared. The affliction is light. The glory is, is heavy. It's a, it's a weight of glory. The affliction is but for a moment. The glory is exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So it is an exceeding weight. It's light affliction, but an exceeding weight. And it's but for a moment, and it's eternal weight of glory. So, so I think, to me, 2 Corinthians 4 is the explanation of Romans chapter 8 when he says they're not worthy to be compared. Why not? Because when you look at the sufferings compared to the glory, the amount of suffering compared to the amount of glory, it, it, there's no there's no comparison. It's a it's a, a a light weight of suffering and an exceeding weight of glory. Uh, when you look at the time of it, the if you if you live to be 93, 94, 128, whatever it is. In, in comparison to eternity, it's still but for a moment. 
uh, and the glory is eternal weight of glory. So even if you suffer every moment of this physical life, it is no comparison to the glory which is eternal, which has no end. Um, so that's the contrast he makes in Romans 8. Uh, I, I want to spend some time here. We're, we're going to get down through, I think, verse 24 tonight, uh, verse 25. Verse 26 and 27, uh, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities uh, and, and intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, we're going we're gonna to spend uh, an evening on verse 26 and 27 because it's a, it's a uh, what do you call them? Difficult, difficult verses. Um, not, not, uh, not, what's the other word? We said we don't, uh, difficult verses. Uh, problem problem it's not a problem verse it's difficult maybe to understand but it's not a problem no verse is a problem they're all they're all they're all just fine um, but verse 26 and 27 there's a lot of really goofy teaching surrounding them as it, when it comes to prayer so we'll come down through verse 25 tonight and then next week we'll hit 26 and 27 and then get down to verse 28 the following week and go on from there but verse 26 and 27 are important an important concept to understand uh, and important to realize what Paul's teaching us there because as I said there's a lot of miscommunication about that passage but back to verse 19 uh, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God for the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, th that, that passage and that what that passage is describing, and this gets into understanding the end times a little bit, what that passage is des describing seems to me to clearly be when, when, uh, when the curse is removed. Um, he talks about, in, in verse 19, the expectation of the creature, and that's all creation, waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So the creation, the cre all creatures in the creation, are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. They're wait and the word manifestation simply means the unveiling. If you, you know, we use the illustration many times. If we had a statue up here, or you go to you know, some, the town square, they had a new statue made of the founder of the, the town or whatever, and they have a sheet over it, and then they unveil, they lift the, the sheet, they unveil the statue, and it's manifest it's made known it's seen so in this case waits for the manifestation of the sons of God the thing that is is uh, veiling us if you will are these bodies of flesh we don't appear as the sons of God we don't look like the sons of God we look uh, like the same creatures that we've always been but when the veil of flesh is removed and when our bodies are changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body then we are manifest as we really are so this is talking about the 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 the, the timing of all of that in that it's talking about what what is involved with that well in verse 20 the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him was subjected the same in hope um, keep your hand here here, go back to Ecclesiastes when you hear that word vanity of course it should you know uh, spark in your mind there's there's one book in the Bible I mean there are many places it's talked about but there's one book that really um, drives home the issue of our vain existence and the fact that uh, we just we just do not uh, do not have any anything to look forward to in this life um, Ecclesiastes 1 1 the words of the preacher Son of David, King in Jerusalem, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. So that, that you know, when he starts talking about vanity, uh, and he says, one generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever, What what is it that that he's, he's pointing out there. What, what is it that causes your life to be vain? It goes away. It goes away. One generation passeth, 
and another generation cometh. And what profiteth a man of all his labor she taketh under the sun? It doesn't matter how much you have. It doesn't matter how much you get. It doesn't matter how much you accomplish. It doesn't matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. What's the common denominator of all men? We all die. We're all going to die. And so it's that death that is the vanity because it doesn't you know no matter what you do and if you get back to that idea that that the sufferings of this life but that also means the any benefits of this life any earthly glory is but for a moment so so no matter what happens no matter what you get in this life suffering or good uh, it's it's but for a moment and that's what makes life vain it's the fact that we die you know he goes on to to you know, kind of relate that to creation in general verse 5 the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose the wind goeth toward the north and turneth about or south rather and turneth about toward the north it whirleth about continually the wind returneth again according to his circuits all the rivers run into the sea yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers came thither they return again all things are full of labor man cannot utter it the eye is not satisfied for seeing nor the ear filled with hearing the thing that hath been it is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done there is no new thing under the sun is there anything whereof it may be said see this is new it hath been already of old time which was before us there is no remembrance of former things neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come uh, with those that shall come after I the preacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem and I gave my my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven this sore travail that God give that hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold all is vanity and vexation of spirit that which is crooked cannot be made straight that which is wanting uh, cannot be be numbered so you know and, and we know the whole book of ecclesiastes goes on this way of just solomon lamenting the fact that no matter and and you know when you think of solomon we've studied solomon many times uh he was he was wealthy beyond any imagination that any of us could conceive of today uh you know all the vessels of his house were pure gold uh, none were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in his days. So he was he was wealthy. Uh, the the kings of the earth came to seek his wisdom. So he had great power because the kings of the earth came to seek his wisdom. Uh, he had seven hundred wives, princesses, three hundred concubines. He was very popular with the ladies, obviously. Um, so it. He had and, and he had all these political alliances based on these various wives that he had. Uh, of course, they turned his heart away from God, the true God. And, and, and he writes this, this book saying, look, I, I've tried it all, done it all, lived it all, seen it all, been it all. And you know what? It's all vanity. And it all goes back to verse 4. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh but the earth abideth forever. No matter what you get or what you achieve, you will die. You look over to chapter 2, um, verse uh, verse 9. So I was, well, just start at, uh, oh, I don't know how far back I have to take it. Verse, let's start at verse, uh, verse, verse 3. Um, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men, uh, which they should do under the heavens all the days of their life. I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchard. And I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. Um, I, I got me servants and maidens. I had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the, and the, the uh, delights of the sons of men as mu musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all them that were before me in Jerusalem. So my wisdom remained with me and, and whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and this was my portion of all my labor then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I labored to do and behold all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun nothing 
So you take that back to Romans chapter 8, the creature, so why is that? Why is it that a man could be as great and powerful and mighty as Solomon and end up his life saying, it's all vanity? The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. We didn't <laughs> volunteer, Adam and Eve didn't volunteer and say, you know, we would like our life on this earth to be just complete vanity. We would like it to mean nothing. But the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him was subjected the same in hope. God subjected us to vanity. It's part of the curse. Because death is a part of the curse, then the vanity of our existence is part of the curse. Um, our, our, and it's why you can't escape it. It's, it's part of the earth, it's in the planet, it's in the earth, it's in us, it's in everything we do, it's in our offspring, it's, it's everywhere present, this vanity of the curse. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of whom who, who hath subjected the same in hope. So God, God made us subject to vanity, God took away any, any meaning that this physical life has in and of itself, but he did that while still holding out hope. He subjected us to vanity, but he didn't leave us hopeless. He subjected us to vanity, but he said, here's hope to have that vanity removed, to to have the, the, uh, the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. To be a son of God and have that vanity removed and the curse of this earth removed. Verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And, and this is an important verse. The creature itself meaning all, all creatures, all of creation, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Keep your hand right there and go to Second Peter. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3. So you have to, to ask yourself, well, what, when, so God's plan is the hope that creation has. He, he subjected all creation to vanity. But he subject all creation to vanity in hope. Well, what's the hope that creation has? Well, the hope that creation has is that the creature itself, the creation, will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The, the hope is that one day, the, and, and hope in Scripture we know is, is, a, is a confident, earnest expectation um, of something good to come. Uh, verse 19, well, I had you go to Second Peter, but if you look at verse 19, back in Romans 8, for the earnest expectation of the creature. That's a good definition of hope. It's an earnest expectation. It's not, you know, we use the word hope often as, well, I, ho I hope it doesn't rain today. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But in Scripture, hope is used as we have a hope, we have an earnest expectation of something that is to come. And our earnest expectation, the earnest expectation of the creature is that the creature, the creation, will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. If you look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, shall, uh, heavens uh, being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth what? righteousness. What is the, the, the earnest expectation of creation? A new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Because the first heaven and the first earth are passed away um, and, and uh, there is a uh, verse 13, nevertheless we, uh, we according to his 
promise. What's the promise? Well, the promise, um, the, the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. He, he has subjected us in, in, to vanity, but it, it subjected the same in hope. So I would, I would argue that the hope, he has subjected us in hope, and a confident expectation of something that is to come, that that hope is the promise. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Is he going to leave the universe in the vain condition in which it now stands? He is not. He is going to redeem the universe. He is going to redeem the heaven and the earth. Of course, if you go over to, to, to uh, Revelation, you see it there uh, as part of the uh, part of end time prophecy that, that John makes. Um, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down uh, from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I, beheld, uh, I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. So God shall wipe away all tears. There shall be no more, what? Death. Death. What is it that makes man's existence vain? One generation passeth away, another generation cometh, the earth abideth forever. And in this context, he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that earth and I'm going to purify it with fire. And once I purify it with fire, uh, there will be, uh, the, the, of course, you know, Revelation is written in the context of, of Israel receiving the new Jerusalem. But, but it's, it's a cleansing of the universe. That new Jerusalem and that new earth is a part of also cleansing the heavens where we are going to dwell. So, so it's, a, it's a cleansing of the universe. It is taking the universe from a situation of vanity and bondage to corruption into a situation of being not being righteous. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that righteousness is, is explained in Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. He wipes away all tears from their eyes. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. Those former things are passed away. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And, and, and what you're reading about there in Revelation chapter 21, there, there shall be no more death, sorrow, tears, crying, pain. Would that be a pretty good description of the sufferings of this present time? It's pretty, pretty close. And, and, and the point of this is that when Paul does, of course, Paul's talking about this in relationship to the body of Christ. And this is what we're going to receive. And this is the, the, the redemption that we're going to receive. And we'll get to that in just a moment here. But when he does it, he puts it in the context of verse 21. The creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The, the creature waits for, hopes for, has an earnest expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is something not just that we're waiting for. This is something that all creation is waiting for. This is something that doesn't just affect us as members of the body of Christ. This is something that affects all creation. This is not just the curse being removed from us as members of the body of Christ. This is the curse being removed, period, and vanity being banished. So that there is no more vanity. So there is no more, and if there is no more vanity, that means There'll be no more death. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more heartache. All those vain things are gone. And that, that is, is all in the context of the day of the Lord. It's when the Lord, we've said it many times, what happens at the day of the, on the, day of the Lord, he makes everything right. Everything that is wrong is right. So Solomon says, that which is, is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is straight cannot be made crooked. But in the day of the Lord, 
Is, can that which is crooked be made straight again? Absolutely. Can that which is wrong be made right again? Absolutely. Can that which is vain be given meaning and purpose again? Absolutely. So, so the undoing of the vanity, the undoing of the situation that Solomon describes in Ecclesiastes happens at the day of the Lord. And in this passage, in Romans chapter 8, Paul, Paul uh, puts us, you know, what's our part in that? As we've said many times, that Paul's purpose is not to, to present a new cross to us. But it's to take the cross that was there all along and, and give it meaning for us. Paul's purpose is not to present a, a new uh, day of the Lord and a new coming of Christ, but to take the day of the Lord and the coming of Christ that's been there all along and say, here's, here's how, to, how that affects us. Here's our part in that. Here's our role in that, in that day of the Lord. Here's how the, the, here's how the removal of the curse and the removal of vanity affects us as members of the body of Christ. And he gets into that next, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So, so who is it? So in verse 21, he's talking about uh, the creature being delivered from the bondage of corruption because we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. So who is it that's going to be, or what is it that's going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption in, in verse 21? It's creation. It's the whole creation groaneth and travaileth. So it's the whole creation that is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And that's those verses we just read. 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Revelation chapter 21. That's, that's describing that event. You know, Paul describes that event in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians. I guess we should probably go there and look at it just to, to make sure we understand the context in which Paul talks about it, um, 2 Thessalonians, and of course in 2 Thessalonians, Paul is, is writing about it in the context of the body of Christ, but he says uh, in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 1, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction in the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. That's, that's, a, a, that's a, a general, worldwide, universe-wide removal of the curse of vanity. All, all that is wrong will be made right. God is going to, all that is crooked will be made straight. And then how does that affect us? Verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. So what, what happens to you in that day? Well, he's admired and glorified in you. You, you are placed in positions that allow his glory uh, to be shown through you. But that's a part of him making everything right. And when you get back to Romans chapter 8, verse 22, the whole creation groans and travails. Then he says in verse 23, how does that relate to us? And not only they, not only the creation out there is subject to vanity, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So how, what's our role in this? What's our part in this? In this lifting of the, 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 uh, the this unveiling of the sons of God and the, uh, the lifting of the vanity that has beset creation uh, and being delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What is our role in that? Well, our role in that is, number one, that we have the same sufferings we are subject to the same vanity that the rest of creation is subject to. If, if vanity, if the number one issue of vanity is death, are we all subject to death still? All you need to do is read this list every week, and yep, we're subject to death still. So we, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we have the Spirit dwelling in us. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Our Spirit has been made alive in Christ. We're crucified with Him. We're buried with Him. We're risen with Him. All the stuff He's been telling us in Romans 6, 7, and 8. But, but, but we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, 
grown within ourselves. Verse 22, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth. Even we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. We wait for the veil of the flesh to be lifted, for we are saved by hope. And that salvation there, and I think, are you going to talk about this Sunday maybe? That salvation there, we are sa saved from what? Well, we're saved from despair. We're saved from, if, if, if all you have is this life, and Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So that's the point here. We're, we're saved from that despair and from that misery by hope. What is the hope? Well, if you go back, the earnest expectation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's the hope, the manifestation of the sons of God. For, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 24, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We wait for the manifestation of the sons of God as they really are. And, and what's the, the good news about that? If you go back up in the passage to uh, verse um, verse 15, for ye have, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That spirit of adoption. What is adoption? We studied last week. It's placing as a son. A full-grown adult son with all the rights and privileges uh, of the Father. Verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we should also be glorified together. And you tie that down to, if we hope for that we see not, then with patience wait for it. We're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And what are we? Sons of God. So how does that manifestation of the sons of God affect? So all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God because that's when the curse is going to be lifted. That's when vanity is going to be lifted. That's when death and tears and crying are going to be eliminated. But how does that affect us? Well, we are sons of God. So for us, it means the redemption of our body. And we're, we, we, so our, our spirit, we have the first fruits of the spirit, but our body is now redeemed. The veil of flesh is lifted, and we are manifested as we really are, the sons of God. And so for the sons of God, that's a very special event because the whole creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God, and we are those sons of God that are going to be manifested. So our role in that redemption of the universe, our role in that lifting of the vanity, our role in the elimination of, of sin and death, our role in that is that we are the sons of God that are going to be manifested. That's why Paul says when he comes to be admired in his saints and to be glorified in them that believe. When he comes to make everything right with fire and judgment and, and, and burn the heavens and the earth and purify them and take away all sorrow and crying and, and, and death, our role in that is that he's glorified and magnified in us in the sons of God because the son is one that manifests the attributes and characteristics of the father and when we are seen as we really are when the veil of flesh is lifted then we, we are, are, are like him not just spiritually but his glory shows out through us to be, be glorified and admired in them that, it's not that them that believe are, are glorifying him it's that he is being glorified in them that believe the sons of God we are seen as sons of God as we really are with his attributes and characteristics so so all of that in Romans 8 so that's you know that's one of the parts of Romans 8 that makes it a really just a, an amazing chapter in my mind is is what's coming for us the the contrast in what's coming for us to what is here now and then how he you know, very seamlessly and matter of factly just ties that in to the day of the Lord and to the, the lifting of the bondage of, of, of uh, corruption that's on all creation and, and kind of sets the time when all that is going to occur. And then when you he, when he get to verse 26, likewise the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then, you know, people try to take that groaning and, and, and hook it back to the creation groans and travails together. 
and you know, it kind of gets messy in there. So we're going to quit at verse 25 for tonight, and we'll look at verse 26 and 27 kind of stand alone because they're they're important verses you know to help us get a good concept then we'll go back to verse 28 the next week so does anybody have a question or comment about what we did tonight verse basically verse 18 down through verse 25 oh well but you know what this is like three in a row that Keith told me that was really good I he, he must be sick I think he's a little sick after all he was coming in talking about Strang getting strangled in bed or something. Well, so you know. Who, and, yeah. and then, uh, then you went under this vanity and hopelessness and everything else. But I brought you back in the end. Right? So there you go. I brought you back in the end. So all right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Very good. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll be dismissed. Don't forget Sunday morning we'll be here of course and uh, you need to sign up Sunday if you're going to the bowling. Uh, please either sign up tonight or on Sunday because we need to give them account. Um, on Monday of how many's going. So be sure to get that taken care of. All right, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are a part of that delivering the creation from the bondage of corruption and that our role in that is to be manifested as we are in truth, as the sons of God, uh, and be seen uh, with your character and your nature and your glory shining through us for all eternity. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, we will see.